Welcome to Living Word Ministries with our director and Bible teacher, Debbie Blank. Debbie's passion is for you to understand and apply God's truths to your life. Now let's listen and enjoy teaching from the Word of God with Debbie Blank. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you and ask you through your Holy Spirit to speak to us in a mighty way. As we continue our study of the kings in Israel, having done David last semester and now moving into Solomon and everything that happens with all the kings and the divisions of the kingdom. We pray that you'll open our hearts and let us see you in these studies. Let us see the people that are mentioned in all these studies and learn from them. Learn from them the good things and then when we see the bad things, let us learn not to do those. You tell us in 1 Corinthians 10 that you give us the Old Testament for our instruction so that we can learn from everyone and everything and learn from you in the Old Testament. So help us have our ears and our eyes, our spiritual ears and eyes open to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Before we get to um, talking about Solomon, we've got to give you a little history of Israel. Can I erase this? Does everybody have it? You have it on your sheet, so I, you should uh, have it now. Let's just briefly walk through the history of Israel. Who, was, who did God use to start the nation of the Jews? Abraham. All right. Abraham was the patriarch, it was called, he was called, because God called him in Genesis 12 to be the father of what would become the Jewish nation. And then he had two sons who were called, oh, well, he had numerous sons, but he had um, two different sons specifically that uh, influence us right now, and those are? Ishmael and Isaac. And who was Ishmael? Okay, he's, he was the son through Hagar, who was the Egyptian maidservant. And he became the father of the Arab nation. So we're not going to put him down because he's the father of the Arab nations. Who's the son who would become the lineage of the Jewish nation? Isaac. Isaac. So we have Abraham, Isaac, and then who else? Who's his son? Jacob. Now here again, there were two sons. Isaac was one son there that was the father of the Jewish nation. And then Isaac had two sons, Esau and Jacob. But the Bible is clear in the book of Genesis that the lineage, the promise of the Messiah, the land, the Jewish heritage would go through Abraham, then Isaac and Jacob. God reiterated to both Isaac and Jacob the same words he gave to Abraham so that there would be no mistake it wouldn't be Ishmael, it wouldn't be Esau, it wouldn't be any of, other, of Abraham's other sons who would be the father of the Jewish nation. It would be Abraham, then Isaac, then Jacob. Now, under Jacob, he had how many sons? Twelve, Twelve sons. And it was through one of his sons that they went to Egypt. Which one was that? No. Joseph. So they went to Egypt because Joseph, after being sold into slavery by his brothers, ended up becoming the second in charge of Egypt, brought them down, his father Jacob and his brothers down to Egypt to live there during the famine. How long did they live there? 400 years. Uh, the Bible says they, they were in slavery 400 years. In the New Testament it says they were there 430 years, but they were in slavery for 400 years. But at the end of 400 years, what did God do? Okay, he delivered them. He brought them out. So um, he, I'm going to say, uh, delivered. And he delivered the Jews from whom? Or through whom? Moses. Moses. All right, so they were delivered through Moses. Did they go directly into the promised land? No. Where did they go? Wanderers. They wandered in the wilderness. For how long? 40, 40 years. Why? Okay, because of their sin. What specifically was the sin? Unbelief. Unbelief, but they did one particular thing. That, that after that, God said, you're going to wander for 40 years. The nope, stirred that was later. Stirred up the fear. The what? Stirred up the fear in the camp. Stirred up fear in the camp, how? Well, when they went over to the promised land, there was a couple, two yuppies, they brought back some fruit, and then 10 of them. Yep. So the camp became terrified. That was it. Numbers 13 and 14 gives you the story of how Moses sent people, in, 12 people, spies, into the promised land. And 10 of them came back and gave a bad report. Two of them came back and gave a good report. Who were the two? 
Caleb and Joshua. But the people listened to the ten, and they were afraid to go into the promised land. So God said, you're going to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. When that 40 years is up, it'll be a whole new generation that goes into the promised land that came out of Egypt. Whole new generation. By the way, if you wonder why do we have the book of Deuteronomy, which is very similar to Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, it's because this is God's giving the second law to the people getting ready to go in. This is a whole new generation going into the promised land, and he's got to tell them what God had told Moses 40 years before. So they were delivered, but they wandered in the wilderness. And they did that for 40 years. After 40 years, where did they go? After they wandered 40 years, where did they go? Across the Jordan into the promised land. And who led them into that? Joshua. Joshua. So Joshua was the leader. We read that in the, all about the going into the promised land of the book of Joshua. They divided the nation up into uh, 12 different segments for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Actually, Israel uh, was divided and then also part of Jordan. The eastern side of the Jordan River was given to three tribes, two and a half tribes of, of Israel. So they went into the promised land. They conquered much of it. Did they conquer it all? No. 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 Of the people, though, after Joshua died, they needed somebody to lead them. So God gave them who? Judges. judges. How many judges did they have? Seven. Deborah was one. The busy bee. Yes? Okay, there's 13 listed in the book of Judges. And then there's two listed in the book of First Samuel. So total, there were 15 judges. Now, these didn't judge Israel as a whole. They judged segments of Israel, different parts of Israel at different times during the 350-year period. But people weren't satisfied with the judges. What did they want? A king. A king. Why? They wanted to be like all the other nations. That's what the Bible says. So God gave them a king. Who was the first king? Saul. Saul. What kind of a king was Saul? He what? He started out good and then yeah. he turned bad. Yeah. He looked like a king. I mean, he was tall and stature and strong and he looked like a king, but he disobeyed God. Consistently disobeyed God. So God had promised him the kingdom, but he took it away because he disobeyed him. And he gave it to somebody of a different lineage. And who was that? David. David. We spent last winter walking through Samuel so we could get to know David, understand him and his character, and, and God calls him a what? Man after, God's own heart. Man after God's own heart. And when we start reading these first two chapters of Kings today, you're going to wonder, wow, really? Okay, but we'll see that. But he was a man after God's own heart. What set him apart from everybody else that God would call him that? He continued to return to the Lord, she said. He made mistakes like you and I make. He made mistakes that you and I would never make. They were so horrible. But every time he did and he was convicted, he repented. He didn't just say, oh, I'm sorry. He repented and returned to the Lord. And it's that heart that God wants because the Bible says we're all sinners and fall short of the glory of God. So we're going <laughs> to sin. It's will we repent when we sin. And he did. That's why God loved him so much and called him a man after his own heart. Well, we're going to learn today David's going to die. And when he dies, who is going to become the next king? Solomon. Solomon. Solomon, his son, will be the next king. Now, unfortunately, after Solomon dies, and I'm getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, but I want you to understand that. After Solomon dies, the kingdom is split in two. His son, Rehoboam, will become king of the southern kingdom, and Jeroboam will become king of the northern kingdom. That's where your king's chart comes into play. And we're not going to get into this now, but I just want to give you a preview that under Solomon that's going to, uh, that's going to change. Now, as we, we're going to open today to 1 Kings chapter 1. And as we do, I just want to tell you the divisions of 1 Kings, which is pretty easy. 1 Kings chapters 1 through 11 is about Solomon. And then in chapters 12, really, but it starts in 11, but in chapters 12 through the end of the book, 22, it's about the kings of this divided kingdom, both Judah and and Israel. So we get into some of those kings once we get into chapter 12 in the book of Kings. In the process, Second Chronicles, which we're going to be studying along with this, talks about Solomon in chapters 1 through 9. 
And then in chapters 10 through 36, it talks only about the kings of Judah. This is called Judah when they separate, and this is called Israel. So kings, we're going to study both of these kings, kings from both of these kingdoms. In Chronicles, we're only going to study kings from this side. That kind of gives you an idea of what we're going to be doing, what we're going to be studying and seeing over the next <coughs> several weeks into Thanksgiving. Are we on the same page? Any questions? Anybody want to add to this? Any comments? All right, that tells you where we're going to be now when we start in 1 Kings chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Who's the first person we see? David. King David. By the way, I would encourage you as you're taking this class to keep a list of all the people that we see. And on that list, write pros and cons. And write what you see about them that's positive and what you see about them in their life that's negative. What we want to emulate, what we don't want to emulate. Because there's a lot of people we're going to see. And there's a lot of people we can learn from, both good and bad. And so that might be a good uh, application for you as we go through the class. First one is King David. And where is he in life? He's old, advanced in age. So who did they give him to keep him warm? It says in verse 3, Abishag, the Shunammite, a virgin that they brought. But did he have her as a concubine? No. No, he did not cohabitate with her. It's interesting to know that when you get that old, how old was he, by the way? 70 is when he died. That old. Not old now. (laughs) But at that point in his life, he didn't or couldn't cohabitate. Why would they give us this information about David and this woman who's keeping him warm? Because the next king would want her. Okay, because she's going to come into play in the next chapter. And we need to know who she is. So she's not a concubine. She's not a concubine. She's just like a nurse who's helping keep him warm. Yes. Chapter, pardon me? Yeah, yeah. So chapter 1 Kings 1, now we look at verse 5, because then we see somebody else. Who is this person? Adonijah. Adonijah. And who is Adonijah? David's second son. Okay, David's second son. It says, Adonijah, the son of Haggith, what did he do to himself? He exalted himself Mm -hmm. and said, I will be king. Mm -hmm. Now, why does he think he should be king? Okay, if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 3. I always want to bring your Bible if you can, because uh, either you use your observation worksheet from the workbooks, or we can use the Bible. In 1 Chronicles chapter 3, it gives us the lineage of David's kids. <coughs> it says, now these were the sons of David who were born to him in Hebron. The firstborn was Amnon. Does anybody know what happened with Amnon. He had a relationship with his sister Tamar. He lusted after her so badly that they concocted the scheme that he'd be sick and she'd be his nurse and she'd come in and then he raped her. Really, absolutely raped her. And it's a fascinating story because once he did it, this um, passionate love that he had for her was gone and turned into hatred. It shows you how sin can deceive us in life, make something look so good and then once we get it, it's worthless to us. So Amnon, the firstborn, had a sexual relationship with Tamar, who had happened to be Absalom's sister. Who's Absalom? Well, let's keep reading. It went on to say, um, the second was Daniel by Abigail the Carmelitess. We don't know anything about this Daniel. The Bible doesn't give us any information about him. The third was Absalom. So the third son was Absalom. Absalom happened to be the sister of Tamar. So what do you think Absalom did to restore the uh, character of his sister? He killed Amnon. So first son is now dead, Amnon, because of what he did. Second son, we hear nothing about. Third son, Absalom. What did Absalom do? He revolted against his father when he was king. Okay. He revolted against his father when he was king, and he did what? He was killed. Yeah. Yeah, he eventually was killed. But he revolted against his dad, David. So much so that David had to flee from Jerusalem and Absalom took over as king in Jerusalem for a period of time. We read about that last spring. 
But uh, then David was able to come back. Absalom was overthrown. David was able to come back to the city. Did David kill Absalom? No. No. He should have because you don't let something like that happen. But what did he do? He did, but not right away. No. He, he let him flee. Absalom fled, and he let Absalom stay away from Jerusalem for a period of time. But then because Joab, the commander of the army, felt bad for Absalom and liked him, he encouraged David to bring him back to Jerusalem. So David brought Absalom back to Jerusalem. But when he brought him back to Jerusalem, what did he do? Didn't speak to him or have anything to do with him. That's right, Nothing. He wouldn't speak to him, he wouldn't have anything to do with him, he wouldn't see him for a long period of time. Then eventually they got together and eventually Joab ended up killing him because of what he did. Now, let me stop here and ask, did David do anything to Abnon when he raped his sister? Did David do anything to Absalom when Absalom usurped the throne? No. 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 What does that tell you about David's parenting skills? He really was. I mean, he really was one who spoiled his kids. He didn't discipline them. He didn't hold them accountable for what they were doing. Anyone, Absalom, son or not, who usurps your throne should be killed immediately once that revolt was taken over. And he wasn't. That's very possible. These happened after Bathsheba and the sins that he committed there. And so maybe he didn't feel he could punish the kids after his sin. But hey, don't let your sin dictate how you respond in life to other things because he should have handled his kids better. I mean, this is not the way you handle your kids. You just don't let them get away with murder and rape. You just don't. You've got to deal with it, but he didn't. Let's continue down now in 1 Corinthians, 1 Chronicles chapter 3 uh, because in verse 2 we saw Absalom and then it talks about uh, the fourth was Adonijah. So that's who we see here in Kings is the fourth son of David. So in this case, where does that put him in the lineage to the king? Yeah, fourth in line, but we've lost number one. We know nothing about number two, so he must have died young or uh, was of no consequence. Number three's (coughs) dead. So this puts number four in lineage to the throne. That's why he said, I will be king. Mm -hmm. Because he thought he would be. It was his inheritance, or at least that's what he thought. But clearly, either he never talked to his dad about this or his dad never talked to him about this. Maybe, you know, again, dad was non-confrontational and may have never told Adonijah that Solomon was going to be king. Oh, yeah, you know what? You are absolutely right. We did read that in this week's study. (laughs) Adonijah knew. (coughs) Right, And, and not only that, but we see that also in the fact that he didn't invite Solomon to the dinner. So we see it there that he knew not to invite him. So you're right. Thank you for, for correcting me that on Anne because that's what I expect you gals to do when I say something that isn't right or when I think one thing and say another. So you keep that up. You gals are right on target. So we have Adonijah. We're introduced to Adonijah in chapter, five, uh, chapter 1, verse 5. Adonijah the son exalted himself, saying, I will be king. So he prepared for himself chariots and horsemen with 50 men to run behind, before him. His father had never what? Crossed him at any time by asking, why have you done so? So that certainly gives us the understanding, perhaps, that David knew what was going on and didn't do anything about it. And and David, I, I give him a little compassion here because I think sometimes he just always wanted to think the best which is, oh, he's just getting a bunch of his friends together and they're just gonna go out and, you know, cause he is the son of the king and you know, maybe he was looking at the positive instead of what this was, what Adonijah was really doing. But Adonijah was doing it. And it says in verse 6, he was also a what? Very oh, very handsome man. So again, he looked like a king. Now, see, I, I always find that interesting because we've got President Obama, past President Obama, who looked like a president. Mm-hmm. And he oftentimes acted like a president in his stature and the way he spoke and the you know, the, the eloquence of, of how he encouraged people and things. I mean, he really did. And then you get President Trump. <laughs> Does he look like a president? No. Does he act like a president? No. no, he doesn't. But the fact is, people want a president. 
that looks like a president. I mean, we, we do. We, we'll take anybody, whether we agree with them or not, if they look like a president, instead of looking for somebody's heart and what their, heart, what their plans are. All right, well, let's continue on now. It tells us that in verse 7. Uh, by the way, if you want to read about Absalom and what he did to usurp the throne, you can read about that in 2 Samuel 15 in that area and, and read all about that. We're not going to for time. But it says in verse 7, he had conferred with Joab. Who was Joab besides the son of Zerath? Okay, he was the commander of David's army. We'll talk about him more in a minute. So Adonijah conferred with him, and he also conferred with who else? Abathar. Who was Abathar? A priest. Okay. It, well, it says he's a priest. So it's they, he conferred with both of them, and following Adonijah, they helped him. Now, this is pretty difficult because Adonijah was David's right arm as a priest. When David fled with, from Absalom over the Kidron Valley to the east, Abathar and Zadok brought the Ark of the Covenant with David and went with David. But David sent him back so that he could spy on Absalom. So Abathar was one of David's mighty priests. And Joab was his commander. Joab did everything for David. And both of these guys have now gone to Adonijah. Do you think they knew that Solomon was to be king? Oh, yes. Yes. yes, we know they did because of the, what Anne just quoted to us. They all knew this. So what does this tell you about them? They went the wrong way. Their they what? They went the wrong way. They chose the wrong <laughs> direction. The wrong direction against God because God was the one who had chosen Solomon. But also, they were not loyal to David, the king. And it, all I could see when I read this was the Democrats and the Republicans. <laughs> you know, it, they each have their own candidate. And if this candidate, if the Democrat gets in, the Republicans are out. And if the Republican gets in, the Democrats are out. So they pick their candidates and they follow them. And I think what happened is that, I think, uh, uh, the conjecture, and I know I always have to look at uh, uh, Petraea over here when I say conjecture, because she reminds me it's not from the Bible. But it, um, you know, I wonder if these two knew if, when Solomon got in if they were going to do something to them to take them out of power. And that's why they supported Adonijah. Or maybe it's because they knew Solomon was weak. He was young. And even David was concerned about his youth and his weakness as a, as a king. And they knew that Adonijah could handle the country. Who knows? We don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. But... There certainly could have been reasons behind it. But who stuck with David in verse 8? Zadok. He was the one who had carried the Ark of the Covenant over with Abathar. He stuck with David. And who else? Benaiah. He is the son of Jehoiada. He would become the commander and take Joab's job later. Nathan. This is not David's son, Nathan. It goes on to tell you later that Nathan, he had a son. Um, this is his... I'm trying to see which one it was. Oh, it was, he was born in Jerusalem under one, two, three, four. So he was the tenth son. Nathan was the tenth son of David. But we know nothing about the, that son of David. This is Nathan the prophet, different person from the son. So Nathan stuck with him, Zadok stuck with him, Benaniah stuck with him, a couple others, Shammai and Ray, and the mighty men who belonged to David were not with Adonijah. So we had loyal people who stayed with David. It, it, there's so much politics involved here when you think about it. You've got an old king, 70 years old, dying. Going to a total change of power. Do you stay with the king or do you go with the new guy? Do you stay with the king's son or the new guy? It's, it's all politics, folks. But there's one person we stay with always. Who's that? God. So if we are seeking <laughs> God's direction and everything, we'll stay with the right person. This is a, a good study on finishing well because as she said, you can make right choices all your life or most of your life. You can make right choices. But if they don't make right choices at the end, it could destroy everything else you've done. Look at the former coach of Penn State. Yes. What was his name? What? Joe, Paterno. Joe Paterno. 
fabulous yeah. reputation all his life. Yeah. And right at the end, mm -hmm. destroyed, and he dies right after that. What, it, what a sad mm -hmm. scenario because of a late in life decision or something that was accused of him of doing. So folks, you know, stay strong all the way to the end because anything can draw us away. So the plot's going to start now. You've got Ananias over here with his merry men. You've got David's merry men over here. David's not even in the game yet. He doesn't even know what's going on. Verse 9, Adonijah, what did he do? Sacrifice, Sacrifice publicly. She, it would have been sheep and oxen and fat lane. And he did this in, in Roga, which was near Jerusalem on the outskirts. And he invited all of his brothers, the king's son, and all the men of Judah, the king's servant, except who? Nathan, it says in verse 10, and Benaniah and Solomon. So everybody's invited except those three. Why? Because they're going to be loyal to David. Okay, they had been loyal to David. And what happens if you invite the king to your, if, excuse me, the king invites you to his inaugural event? You go. You go, and also you're, you have to be loyal to the king, and the king has to be loyal to you. And he knew these wouldn't be loyal to him, but he also didn't want necessarily to be loyal to them. He would usurp their power, either kill them or put somebody else in their place once he became king. So if he invites them, he has to protect them, and he's not going to do that. She said Adonijah was conspiring. Clearly, he was conspiring to take over the kingship because he thought he had the people to do it. But that's going to change. Uh, it says in verse 11 that Nathan went and spoke to whom? Bathsheba. Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, saying, Have you not heard that Adonijah, the son of Haggith, has become king and David our Lord does not know it? Mm -hmm. Now, has he officially become king? No. no, but he's making himself king. He hasn't been anointed king by the proper authorities, but he's making himself king by raising up from the people. So Nathan realizes what's happening. He goes to Bathsheba and they, they concoct a plan. <laughs> Nathan says to Bathsheba, now you go into King David, and what you're going to say to him, verse 13, have you not heard, my lord, O king, say, have you, have you not, my lord, O king, sworn to me, your maidservant, <laughs> saying, surely Solomon, your king, your son, shall be king after me, and he shall sit on the throne. Why then has Adonijah become king? Behold, while you're still there speaking with the king, Nathan says, then I'm going to come in, and I'm going to reiterate what's happened. So they concoct this plan, and it works. Bathsheba goes in. She tells the king. The king calls for Nathan. Nathan confirms it all in the next few, several sentences. Um, verses 13 to 21, Bathsheba goes to the king. He says, what do you wish? And she repeats that. Uh, and she says, Adonijah is king. And then um, she finishes it in verse 21 by saying, It will come about as soon as my lord the king sleeps with his fathers, that I and my son Solomon will be considered offenders. Yeah. So she ends by appealing to the king by saying, what's going to happen to her and Solomon? They're going to be killed. As offenders, they will be killed. So then, verse 22, <laughs> Nathan comes in, and he reiterates the same thing. He ends by saying in verse 27, has this thing been done by my lord, the king? And you have not shown to your servants who should sit on the throne of my lord, the king, after him? He knows the answer to that, but he's appealing to the king for what he said. Now, let, let's just think about this. Is Nathan doing this to save his job? No. Is Bathsheba doing it so her son can be king? Yeah. Maybe. I mean, we don't know, but I think both of them are doing it <laughs> because they know what God has said. They know what David has said. They know what his wishes are. If you've ever been through the sitting of a will or the discussion of family members after somebody dies, and you know what the will of somebody is, but it's not being carried out. What do you do? If you know something is right, especially when it's from God. I mean, it's not a matter of David wants this or Bathsheba or Nathan wants this. It's a matter of God has said this is what's going to happen. I mean, remember back in 2 Samuel chapter 7, God made a covenant promise with David. He didn't use Solomon's name here, but David knew what he was talking about. He made the Davidic covenant when he said in verses, verses 12 through 16, when your days are complete 
and you lie down with your fathers, I'm going to raise up from your descendants after you who will come forth from you and I will establish his kingdom. And he shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne and his kingdom forever. Now, if you read the story of David, I think it was more in Chronicles than in Samuel. David was helping Solomon get ready to build the house of the Lord before David ever died. So David knows that Solomon's his successor. So does everybody else. And this says here that he's going to build the house. Verse 14, I'll be a father to him and he'll be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I will correct him with the rod of men and the strokes of the sons of men. But my kindness shall not depart from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Verse 16 is key. He says, in your house, David, and your kingdom, following through Solomon, shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. In other words, it's going to go through you to your son who's going to build the house that we know as Solomon and David knew as Solomon, down through that lineage to the Messiah. And if you look at your king sheet that you have in front of you, what you will find out as we go through is that all of these kings on this side, on the left-hand column of the southern kingdom, flow directly from the lineage of David to Solomon to Rehoboam and straight down. The kings on this side... We're all different families and dynasties. No connection. But on this side, they run from David all the way down and eventually to the Messiah. That's what God promised David, and it would go through Solomon. So David knew that. I believe Nathan and Bathsheba, why they had a plan, the plan was to follow God's plan and to let the king know what was happening because clearly he didn't know. All right, now let's see what David decides to do. 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 32. Then David said, Call to me Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, Benaniah the son of Jehoiada. And they came to the king's presence, and the king told him to do what in verse 33? Okay. First of all, <coughs> take with you the servants of the Lord. So gather all these people and put Solomon on the king's mule uh, uh, let him ride on my mule and bring him where? Gihon. To the Gihon. I call it Gihon. It's probably Gihon. I don't pronounce anything right when it comes to Hebrew. I find that out when we go to Israel and the guys are giving the proper pronunciation. But if I said Hatzor, you guys would know when, not know what I was talking about. Or if I said some of the other names, you wouldn't. So anyway, they go down to the Gihon. Now, where's the Gihon? Does anybody know? The, the Gihon is in the, the um, Kidron Valley. Uh, Jerusalem is kind of shaped like a W. It's called the Sheen. Uh, here is the city of David. So I'll put here David. Here is the Temple Mount. Over here, over here you have the Mount of Olives on the right hand, the east side. And uh, so here, uh, lives. here you have what's known as the Kidron Valley. Over here you have the Hinnom Valley. But the Hinnom Valley goes down across down to here. So, and then right here you have a valley, and it's called the Tai Tyropoean Valley that goes right through the middle there. Now, the significance of this is God said He would. He didn't say write, but and He didn't say stamp, but whatever the word He was, it was like that. He would stamp His name on the city of Jerusalem. And when you put the sheen there, the sheen represents El Shaddai, the almighty hand of God, God all-sufficient one. So when you look at Jerusalem from above, you see this, what looks like a sheen because of these three valleys. So the Kidron Valley is here, and the Gihon would have been down right around here. But you've got to understand, this is the city of David, and this is the Gihon. So he's taking him down to an important place because there's water there. There needs to be water there for what they want to do. It's an so he can be anointed. But they're taking him out in front of all the people. In verse 34, it says, Then Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet did what? Anointed him. You see, in order to be king, you have to be anointed. Saul was anointed, David was anointed, and now Solomon is anointed. What is the point of anointing someone? It was? It has to do with God watching. God's. Okay. It's God calling this person. It's an outward sign. It's like baptism, and it's an outward sign of a commitment. In this case, it's a commitment to be the king. 
So this time it says that he's anointed. Didn't say that of Adonijah. And not only that, they also blew a trumpet. The trumpet was used for many things back then, but one of the ways is celebration and announcing the arrival of the king. So they blew a trumpet and they said, Long live live King Solomon. Then it says, verse 35, Then you should come up after him, and he should come and sit on my throne and be king in my place. Why? For I have appointed him to be ruler over Israel and Judah. He should have said God has appointed him, but he said I, and the fact is he had because God had told him to. So uh, what they're going to do, they've got this plan to do. And it says in verse 48, the king also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who has granted one to sit on my throne today while my eyes still see it. So he's doing what God called him to do. Now, let me ask you here, uh, is the majority always right? No. The majority, it sounded like we're with Adonijah. But the majority of the right people were with Solomon. God being the first, the king being the second, but then the other people. So it's not important that you be with the majority. It's important that you be with God and do what God tells you to do. And that might be the minority. Have you ever been in the minority? In a situation where you had to stand up for God? It's not easy. Uh, uh, Especially for those of us who like to get along with people. You don't want to be criticized. You don't want to be the outcast. But when you're standing with God, you're never an outcast. Because you always have one with you. And that one is the only one that counts. So do what's right in God's eyes. Don't go with the majority. The majority may be right, but they may be wrong. We don't go by consensus. We don't go by democracy when it comes to God. God's a theocracy. He tells us what to do and we follow him. That's the important thing. So what happens? What, verse 49. Then all the guests of Adonijah were? Oh, good question. She said when she looked these names up, and I skipped these verses, we're going to go back to them starting in verse 38. Uh, When these people went out, the Cherizites and the Pelestites went out with them, and they were Philistines. Philistines are Gentiles. They're from the ocean. They're from the the Mediterranean area. They're not Jews. Why would they be supporting David? Why would Philistines be supporting David? Because what did David do to a Philistine? He He killed Goliath, the Philistine. So why would they be supporting him? Think back to your study in Samuel. Well, he had comforted them. I mean, they were at peace, and they had given their allegiance to his kingship. Yeah, yeah. David had a lot of Philistine friends. They had made peace in many areas in the Philistines with David. And David had, for a period of time, gone to the Philistines for help. And so he had friends that were Philistines okay. that supported him. <coughs> so that these Philistines would have been some of those friends. Okay, thanks. So let me get back to here. David told them what to do. They did it. And this is it right here in verse 38. Uh, They did exactly what they were told to do. Verse 41 says, Now Adonijah and all the guests who were with him heard it as they were finishing eating. When Joab heard the sound of the trumpet, now he knows the sound of the trumpet is for war, it's for coronation. That means it's got several things that it's for. And Joab's thinking, well, let's see, wait a minute, we're not going to war and... You know, are they coronating Adonijah? What's it, what's it ringing for? What are they s- sounding the trumpet for? Why is the city in such an uproar, he says. Verse 42. When he was still speaking, Jonathan came in, and they thought this Jonathan was coming in with good news. But he says in verse 43, No, our Lord King David has made Solomon king. Oh everybody's sitting at the banquet thinking they're on the right side and now they could be killed as they leave the banquet. I mean, just imagine that. Have you ever been in a situation where you thought you made the right decision and then all of a sudden it found out it was a wrong one and you're wondering, oh no, what's going to happen to my job? What's going to happen to my friendship? Well, how's my child going to react to this? It's a pretty terrifying thing when you've made the wrong decision and it's come to be known to other people. So then they told him what had happened. He'd ridden the king's mule. The king anointed him. The people were rejoicing. Solomon was sitting on the throne. And the king even, it says in verse 47, and the king bowed himself on the bed. So, I mean, that's really the final signal, is the king bowed down to Solomon as the new king. 
That's when the people were terrified. It says in verse 49. And what, was, what does it say about Adonijah in verse 50? Oh, yeah. No kidding. Where'd he go? Okay, he, took to, he went and held on to the horns of the altar in the tabernacle. Why? Mercy. mercy. To get mercy so that he would not be killed for what he's done. Because what he did was a treasonous act. It should have been killed right away, just like Absalom should have been killed right away. We'll see what happens here in, in a little while. Because it says in verse 51, it was told Solomon, Adonijah is afraid of King Solomon. He's taken the horns of the altar. Verse 52, Solomon says, if he is a worthy man, not one of his hairs will fall to the ground. But if wickedness is found in him, he will die. <coughs> now, was that a smart thing to do for the king? Yeah, I think of some of the movies like The Godfather or you know, th th some of those things. Or even, even presidents, when they come in, they automatically get rid of the other, the other people and they bring in their own people. And in The Godfather, boy, if you, f if you cross somebody, you're whacked. <laughs> but in this day and age, you would always, always kill someone who tried to usurp your throne. But Solomon didn't. Was that wise? I think that's probably key, and that is that he knew the Lord had given him the throne and he was trusting the Lord in this. And also, everybody's colors will always come out. Yeah. Well, yeah, and, and you mentioned David's sick. Think of this. Yeah, How would you like to have your father, who's on his deathbed, know that you just killed his son? Right. Even though the son had done what he had done. Right. When David hadn't dealt with two other sons, wouldn't it hurt David significantly? This was not the right time, yeah. clearly. So it says here, verse 52, if he's a worthy man, not one of his hairs will fall to the ground. Verse 53, so Solomon sent and brought him down from the altar, and he came and prostrated himself before Solomon, and Solomon said to him, go to your house. In other words, your life has been spared, is what he said. Uh, but as he said, there was a condition if he's a worthy man. And we'll see that as we move to chapter 2 now. 1 Kings chapter 2 is so interesting what happens as we get uh, into his life as king. But before he dies, David gives instructions to his son. As David's time to die drew near, he charged Solomon, his son, saying, I'm going the way of all the earth. Good, good wisdom here. He says what? First, be strong. strong. And? Show yourself, a man. show yourself a man. Take charge. A and that's what he says in verse 3 is? Keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his ordinance, and his testimonies according to what is written in the law of Moses, that you may succeed in all you do and wherever you turn. So it gives him some real wisdom here. Be strong, show yourself a man. And then the third point is the most important one. He's to do what? Follow God in everything, in whatever you do. Because if we follow God, there's a result. And what's that result? Blessing. You will succeed in whatever you do and wherever you turn. You know, that success looks different in every situation. Some of us think if we lose our job and we, and we uh, are without a job for a couple years and we have no money, uh, that success would be to have a big job and it'll, it'll fill up our bank accounts again. Well, it might not be. It might be that success is working part-time uh, until we get a, the good job God wants to place us in so we can minister, minister to somebody. And it might be for us to trust in God during that time for him to provide our needs. Mm -hmm. sure. See, we don't always know. The important thing is that we always trust God in every situation. Marilyn doesn't know what's going to happen to her, but she trusts God. I mean, look, at she's here today. <coughs> she trusts God. We've got to trust God because whether we live or die, we live and die for the Lord. Mm -hmm. And whatever God chooses to do, we do what we can do for him, and then he's in charge. We have to trust him and know that his, his guidance is best. All right, good wisdom from David. Great fatherly advice before he dies. But then, <laughs> David, so funny what happens here. What does he do now? <laughs> yeah, well, he says it a little nicer than kill all those guys. In effect, what he's saying to Solomon is, Solomon, I want you to take care of all the guys that I didn't. Yeah. Yeah. When I'm dead, I want you to settle the score. 
I didn't, but I want you to. Now, this is so interesting. Why did David not build the house of the Lord? Why did God tell him he couldn't build the house of the Lord? He was a man of war. So the first thing he tells Solomon to do, who's going to build the house, is kill all these guys. Amazing. Uh huh. Yeah, that's exactly right. So here I am. I'm, I'm King David, and, and Grace is Solomon. And so I say to Grace, I say to Solomon, I say, now, when you become king, you better watch out for Nancy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's wound up. Because, yeah, she's wound up. Remember, remember what she's done to me. And so she might well turn on you, too. You know, it's kind of that thing. He's preparing him for who these leaders are, to know exactly who they are and what they've done, and to be wise as to how he deals with them. Oh, yeah, clearly not for him to do those things now. He should have dealt with them at the time uh, properly, but he didn't. Well, the first person he talks about is Joab. Remember, Joab was his right arm, the commander of his army forever. And he says, now, you also know what Joab, the son of Zariah, did to me. What he did to the two commanders of the armies, to Abner, the son of Ner, and Amasa, the son of Jether, whom he killed. He also shed the blood of war in peace, and he put the blood of war on his belt above his wa- about his waist and on his sandals of his feet. So he not only is warning him about Joab, he's telling him what he did. He killed two commanders. What do you know or what do you remember about Abner and Amasa? Who, first of all, who is Abner? Raise your hand. He was the commander of King Saul's army. So when Joab was working with David, trying to keep David safe and fight as one of his mighty men, Abner was running King Saul's army to kill David. So Abner is clearly an enemy, isn't he? Well, he was, except that... He later rallied all of Israel to accept David's rule. That's it. He later, when Saul died, and he was working with Ishbosheth, his son, he went against Ishbathus, came over to David, and was getting all of Israel to come over to David's side, all of Saul's people to come over to David's side. But when Joab heard that, he got mad, and he went and killed him. Why did he kill him? Did he just kill him to kill him? No, because he had, Joab killed his brother Asaphel, or A, I don't know how you pronounce I his know. name, Asahel. Asahel? <laughs> yeah, because Ama- Abner in war... When Jesal was fighting David's guys, Abner killed Joab's brother in war. You know, those things happen. But Joab was carrying a grudge. And so even though Abner had come to help the king, Joab went against the king by killing Abner. Mm. How about Amasa? What happened with Amasa? Mm. I'm sorry, what? He killed him too. too. Amasa was, um, Absalom had made Amasa his, his um, uh, commander is what had happened. And so he and Joab ended up killing Amasa too, another commander of the army. Uh, not just in war, but in vengeance. And then he's also the one who killed Sa- uh, David's son Absalom. And he, sh- and he didn't have permission to do that. So Joab is a loose cannon. He's been loyal to the king, David, but on the other hand, he's taken power into his own hands. I think probably, you know, looking at this kind of a character, he might well have seen David's weaknesses. And instead of asking the king or doing what he knew the king wanted, he took matters into his own hands because he thought the king wouldn't. He did threaten him one time, didn't he? That if you don't don't do this or so, I'll just take all my stuff away. Well, Abner did that. With Ishbosheth, so I'm not sure that Joab did with, um, yeah, I, I don't remember that, but he certainly could have. So we have a loyal person on one hand, but not a loyal person on another. So he's warning him about him. And he says his caution in verse 6 is, act according to your wisdom. So use your wisdom. But then he says, don't let his gray hair go down to Sheol in peace. Use your wisdom, but make sure you kill him. <laughs> That's kind of how I read it anyway. Right. He has to be held accountable. And that's what he's doing here is David is telling Solomon to hold these people accountable. And I think he did when he said to Adonijah, you're safe, go home. 
you know, he gave them some accountability. Are you going to do the right thing? And we're going to see the responses here as to how they acted. Verse 7, he says, but show kindness to the sons of Barzillai and let them be among those who eat at your table. What had, the, what had Barzillai and his sons done? They taken the baby when he was fleeing from Absalom. Okay. When David fled from Absalom, Barzillai took care of him. And David said to him, I want you to come and sit at my table, which is a great honor, which means leave your, everything you have in, the, in your kids' hands and you are with me forever. And you have that honor. But he said, no, I'm too old. Let my son have that honor. Chislam, I think it was. Mm -hmm. uh, have my honor. Mm -hmm. uh, now verse, so he says, bless this guy. Verse 8, he says, behold, there's with you Shammai, the son of Geras. And now it was he who cursed me with a violent curse on the day I went to Mahanam. But when he came down to me at the Jordan, I swore to him by the Lord, saying, I will not put you to death with the sword. So here again we have David fleeing from Absalom. When he does, Barzillai comes out and gives him food and uh, shelter and protection. But Shemai curses him all the way up Gross. the Mount of Olives and all the way down the Mount of Olives. He just curses him. Yep, throws rocks at him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but when David's on his way back to Jerusalem to take over the kingship again, Shammai shows up and he bows down to him. Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry. I screwed up. And King David, Joab wanted to kill him right there. And King David said, no. What he's saying, what he said about me may have been God's will. So David didn't allow him to be killed. But now... He says in verse, uh, nine. Uh, oh gosh, yeah, I'm, ooh, God, I've got a long way to go. Verse 9, um, do not let him go unpunished, for you are a wise man and you will know what ought to be done to him and you will bring his gray hair down to Sheol <laughs> with blood. So I don't think David is as much saying go out and kill him as much as he's saying watch him because he's going he's gonna to do something wrong and then you're going to have the right to take care of him. But you need to know that he's a traitor. Uh, verse 10, then David slept with his fathers. He was king for 40 years, seven in Hebron, 33 in Jerusalem. Solomon sat on the throne of David and his kingdom was firmly established. That's a key verse, key word, phrase in this chapter. It, we see it three times. What Solomon is doing here, what David suggests and what Solomon does is he does it to firmly establish his kingdom. So there is no doubt who is king. We see this in verse 45 and 46 also. Now Adonijah shows up in verse 13 and he goes to Bathsheba and he says to Bathsheba, you know what? I just have one request. Would you go to Solomon for me and ask him just one little thing? Can I have Abishag the Shunammite? Can I go into her? Can I have her as my wife? And Bathsheba doesn't know any different. I, I'm not sure why she wouldn't know that, but she didn't know any different. So she says, okay, I'll go to the king on your behalf. Maybe she felt sorry for him because of everything he'd gone through. So she goes to King Solomon and says, hey, at night, this, I'm obviously using Debbie's interpretation here. I'm not reading it from scripture because of time. She says, as Adonijah just asked for one little thing. He'd just like to have Abishag as his wife. Solomon goes, what? Are you kidding me? Verse 22, King Solomon answered and said to his mother, and why are you asking Abishag for Adonijah? Ask for him also the kingdom, for he is my older brother, even for him, for Abathar the priest, and for Joab the son of Zeruiah. He's, what's, what's so bad about him taking this uh, gal who was not a concubine of David, but had been with David and was seen as one of perhaps his companions? What was wrong with him having her? She represents the next king. She, she belongs to the king, so she represents the next kingdom. What did Absalom do when he usurped the throne? He had relations. He went up on the top of the rooftop and had relations with all of David's concubines so everybody could see it, which made him king by saying, David's household is now my household because he had relationships with those concubines. And people knew that. So by taking his David's concubine, he was going to, he was calling himself the king. He was usurping the kingdom, trying to. So that's when you know, David, Solomon took care of them. Why didn't Bathsheba know that? I don't know why she didn't know it. Yeah. Uh, who knows? 
you know, women didn't, women were to be pretty at that time. They weren't to be involved in the politics and everything that goes on. So why didn't she know it? I don't know. But so it tells us in verse 24, the king said, Adonijah shall surely be put to death. And he sends Benaniah to put him to death because he, he not only was a traitor to the throne before what he'd done, Solomon had given him mercy, and now he's a traitor again, trying to usurp the throne. So he's put to death. Verse 26, Abathar, the priest, he told him, he said, go to Anthem. You can stay there. You deserve it. You, deserve, you don't deserve to die because you helped my father. You will not be put to death at this time because you carried the ark of the Lord before my father David and because you were afflicted in everything with which he was afflicted. But he did dismiss him from his job and he sent him home. So it's great to see the different ways he dealt with these people. He didn't just kill them all. He showed mercy and kindness to people who had helped David. But he did deal with the people whose true colors were shown by their actions after they had been shown mercy. Verse 28, we have Joab. And he says, the news came to Joab that the Adonijah was dead. So he went and grabbed the holdings of the altar because he thought, okay, Adonijah was safe there. I'm going to be safe. But it was time. Verse 29, it was told King Solomon that Joab had fled to the tent of the Lord and he's inside the altar and Solomon sent Benaniah. He says, you go kill him. So Benaniah goes and says, come out from the temple. And he says, no, if I come out, you're going to kill me. And he said, yeah. And he said, I'm not coming out. So he killed him right there. Now, that's a real no-no. I mean, now you don't do that. But this man needed to be dealt with. The consequences of his sin needed to be dealt with. And if he wasn't going to come out, then you do with it how it needs to be dealt with. And he did. You know, sometimes we think, I can't do that because it goes against what my religion believes or has taught me. Or I can't do that because of uh, something. But when God gives us clear direction, we have to put him before we put our traditions our religions we have to put the word be of truth before what we hear from other people so Joab's done with um, it says in verse 35 the king appointed Benaniah a head over the army in his place and the king appointed Zadok the priest in place of Abathar so now Joab's dead Abathar has been exiled verse 36 we have Shammai he says for Shammai build for yourself a house in Jerusalem verse 36 but don't go out from there to anywhere else. So for three years, Shammai stayed in Jerusalem. But guess what happened? One of his slaves or some of his slaves left, his servants. And so they, he went out to get them because Solomon said, if you leave Jerusalem, you're going to die. I don't know why he didn't send his servants out to get these lost servants. But maybe he was trying to use, you know, show his power or maybe he couldn't trust his servants. Who knows? But he made the mistake of leaving Jerusalem. And maybe he thought, well, this is what the king said three years ago. He's probably forgotten by now. Ah, uh, you know, do, when you tell your kids something, do you forget it three years later? He had a consequence that was given to him. <laughs> you don't remember it. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> so they found the servants in Gath and they brought him back, but they told the king. So verse 42, the king sent and he called Shammai. Did I not make you swear before the Lord? And he reiterated what the promise was. Verse 43, why then have you not kept the oath of the Lord? Verse 44, the king said to Shammai, you know all the evil which you acknowledged in your heart, which you did to my father David. Therefore, the Lord shall return your evil on your head. Again, it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks. This guy was shown mercy. He was allowed to live in Jerusalem, but his heart was dark. And he went out and just totally obeyed, disobeyed the king and didn't think a thing about it. And he died because of it. 45, but King Solomon shall be blessed and the throne of David shall be established before the king, the Lord forever. So this king commanded Benaniah, Benaniah. And he went and fell upon Shammai and he died. And the kingdom was established in the hands of Solomon. Before Solomon could move on, and really be seen as a king, he needed to deal with the old baggage. He had the wisdom of his father who told him that, and he carried through and carried out things that David hadn't been willing to do, but now Solomon knew he needed to do, and because he did the right thing before the Lord, his kingdom was established. How about you in your life? Do you do the right thing before the Lord? 
Are you seeking God's direction in your life or are you seeking the favor of men? Are you sticking with the majority or are you willing to stick with God and maybe in the small minority in the decisions that you make? If we follow God in everything we do, he will establish our kingdoms. That kingdom might be our husbands and ourselves. It might be our children and ourselves. We don't know what our kingdom looks like. But if we follow God in everything, he will take care of it all. Do you believe that? I hope so. If not, ask God to show you what he can do in your life and through you to establish your kingdom as he established Solomon's. And by the way, Solomon's kingdom was established because God not only told him to do it, but Solomon did it. So our kingdoms are established too by our obedience to God, not just what he tells us, but our obedience to him. Let's pray. What an example we have here from David and Solomon. What an example we have from all these men who were faithful, loyal, or traitors. We learn a lot from each one of them. Oh, Father, I want to be like David, a man after your own heart. Uh, I don't want to do the things he did. I want to deal with things right away. I think David perhaps learned in his later life that he should have dealt with these people, so he passed that on to Solomon, so Solomon could be established in his kingdom. But let us be established in your kingdom. God, if we're doing anything wrong, show it to us. If we're doing things right and we need to change, show that to us. More importantly, let us know you and let us be obedient to you in all we did, like Solomon was as he started out. Thank you for this man that we're going to learn about for the next few weeks and how he loved you as his father David did. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us today on Living Word Ministries with Debbie Blank. Living Word Ministries is a listener-supported program. To contact Debbie Blank, you may do so at livingwordministry.org. That's www.livingwordministry.org. Please tune in each week at the same time for Living Word Ministries with Debbie Blank.